National Desk, America's News Now. Developing now commuter chaos. We expect that to take some number of months. As we come on the air, a highway collapse in Philadelphia causing a headache for travelers. The investigation underway as crews rush to restore your morning commute. Inside the indictment, an unprecedented week ahead met with dueling views on the former president's federal charges. If he wants to store material in a box in, in a bathroom, if he wants to store it in a box on a stage, he can do that. That is, the, that, that is just what the law and the standard is. The case heading to court as legal experts weigh in on what's ahead. Weather watch millions across the southern U.S. at risk of another day of dangerous storms. The alerts taking shape as cleanup from severe weekend weather gets underway. On the offensive, Ukraine ramping up its campaign to recapture key positions on the war front. The high stakes battles underway this morning. Live from the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton in for Jan Jeffcoat. It's great to be here with you. It is Monday, June 12th. And this morning, hundreds of thousands of commuters starting the week with a potential headache, being forced to take a different route to work after a major roadway collapse. Look at these images right here. Right now, a heavily traveled portion of I-95 in Philadelphia is closed, and officials say it could take months to repair. Let's get right over to Ryan Smith at the live desk. And today, Ryan, those backup travel plans are being put to the test. Yeah, commuter chaos for sure in a major American city here. A live look this morning over Interstate 95 in Philadelphia, where traffic still being diverted this morning. Just a few exits down from where a section of highway collapsed early Sunday. Now, repair crews working throughout the night on this to remove that collapsed section. And according to the Coast Guard, a tanker truck carrying thousands of gallons of gasoline catching fire underneath that highway, causing it to sever and then crumble. That tanker still trapped underneath the highway this morning, and officials say so far no injuries or deaths reported. Now, this video captured by a driver showing the heavy smoke stretching across both sides of that highway before the collapse. Crews were on the scene there for several hours on Sunday, and repairs are now expected to take several months moving forward. Pennsylvania's Governor Josh Shapiro announcing he plans to issue that disaster a declaration today to help speed up federal funds. To expedite this process and to cut through the red tape, tomorrow morning I plan to issue a disaster declaration allowing the Commonwealth to immediately draw down federal funds and move quickly to repair and reconstruct this roadway. That major shutdown no doubt causing headaches for drivers out there. Pennsylvania's Transportation Secretary saying the I-95 segment carries roughly 160,000 vehicles per day likely the busiest interstate across Pennsylvania. State and federal officials are investigating this morning, including the National Transportation Safety Board. We will continue to monitor the situation. Any updates that come in, we'll bring them to you right here at the Live Desk and online at thenationaldesk.com. And developing now, Ryan, former President Donald Trump preparing to appear at a federal courthouse in Miami tomorrow. He's facing 37 counts in connection with the documents found during a raid of his Florida home back in August. The former president is still calling the charges a political witch hunt. And a new poll out this morning shows nearly half of Americans agree. The ABC News Ipsos poll reveals 47% of respondents think the charges are politically motivated. 37% say they are not and 16% say they're unsure. President Trump will have his day in court, but espionage charges are absolutely ridiculous. Whether you like Trump or not, he did not commit espionage. This is nothing like we've ever, anything we've seen before. Um, and, and there's very likely, I think, gonna, gonna come down to some type of guilty um, uh, verdict on, on the president, at least on some of these charges. Trump says he plans to speak at a public event tomorrow night at his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey, after the arraignment. The National Desk, Christine Frizzell, brings us his comments over the weekend and an analysis of the unsealed indictment from legal experts. Former President Donald Trump once again on defense, plowing ahead with claims a 37-count federal indictment against him is purely political.
The ridiculous and baseless indictment of me by the Biden administration's weaponized Department of Injustice will go down as among the most horrific abuses of power in the history of our country. But unlike in previous cases, former Trump defenders say this time is far different. It is a serious threat. If even half of it is true, then he's toast. And this idea of presenting Trump as a victim here, a victim of a witch hunt, uh, is ridiculous. Contained within the 37 count indictment that Trump, without authorization, retained at the Mar-a-Lago Club secret and top secret documents concerning nuclear weaponry of the United States, the timeline and details of an attack in a foreign country, and military capabilities of foreign countries. Outlining multiple ways he obstructed the FBI and grand jury investigations to conceal his retention of classified documents. Charges some are playing down, but still highlight an audio recording described in the indictment. They're paragraphs 34 and 35 that disclose the tape in which he essentially admitted that a document that he showed him, maybe just flashed it in front of him, we don't know could have been declassified, but it was not declassified. Still, some Trump supporters remain ever loyal, pointing to a 1988 Supreme Court case, Navy versus Egan, which sided with expansive presidential authority over national security matters. It said the president's ability to classify and control access to national security information flows from the Constitution. He decides, he alone decides. The law on full display for the world to see when President Trump appears in court this Tuesday. I'm Christine Frizzell reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. Lawyers for former President Donald Trump comparing his case to President Joe Biden's classified document scandal. The National Desk, Kayla Gaskins joins us live this morning from Capitol Hill. Kayla, why do some law lawyers, why do they argue that Trump is a better defense than Biden? Well, Didi, Donald Trump's attorney, Alina Haba, is not directly overseeing this document case, but she says Trump has a stronger defense here than Biden because he had the power to declassify the documents during his time as president. Now, Biden's documents were from his time as a senator and vice president. Haba was also asked about the possibility of a plea deal. That's an admission of guilt. He would never admit guilt um, because there was nothing wrong with declassifying documents, taking documents with you, negotiating with NARA. The only thing that was wrong was the raid on his home and the complete dual tier system of justice that we're seeing here when the Biden family is being treated completely differently than the Trump family. So far, President Biden has not been interviewed by the special counsel overseeing his case. His legal team is reportedly negotiating preconditions for an interview, which would need to happen before any work is finalized. Live on Capitol Hill, I'm Kayla Gaskins for the National Desk, America's News Now. Following some breaking developments here at the Live Desk, six people shot, three of them killed at a home in Annapolis, Maryland overnight. This morning, a person of interest we've learned is in custody. Right now, police are trying to figure out a motive here, but say it was not a random attack. A very stable community. This is unusual for this area. Um, no area is immune. Uh, we're living in times now where this, uh, the availability of handguns are, are plentiful right now. We have people who are willing to use them. Now, one of the survivors here was flown by helicopter to a nearby trauma center. We'll, of course, bring you more details as they come in right here from the live desk. All right, we'll check in with you soon, Ryan. Thank you. New this morning, Republican Miami Mayor Francis Suarez is hinting at a possible presidential run. He's been laying down the groundwork in recent months and has even made trips to early voting states. I'm going to be making, like you said, a big speech in the Reagan Library, and I think it's one that America should tune into. It's one where we talk about uh, what's, what the future of our country should be. It should be a future that creates prosperity, not poverty. He previously criticized Florida Governor Ron DeSantis for fighting with Disney and vocally opposed Trump in the 2016 and 2020 elections. New polling out this morning shows Trump still holding a wide lead over GOP candidates. According to CBS and YouGov, he's at 61 percent. DeSantis is at 23 percent. Tim Scott and Mike Pence both are polling at 4 percent. DeSantis, meantime, has picked up his first endorsement from a governor. During a campaign event in Tulsa over the weekend, Kevin Stitt of Oklahoma said he's backing DeSantis for the way his state handled the COVID-19 crisis in Florida. 
He noted DeSantis did not surrender states' rights and individual liberties to what he called groupthink. In Florida, the rest is history because we got it right and people like Cuomo and Newsom got it wrong and their states have still not recovered. And Governor Stitt was endorsed by former President Trump. He received 55% of Oklahoma's votes last year. George Soros is handing down his multi-billion dollar empire and massive political power to his son. 37-year-old Alexander Soros will take control of $25 billion and the nonprofit Open Society Foundations. The Wall Street Journal says that organization directs $1.5 billion to universities and left-leaning political action committees every year. Alex Soros also told the Wall Street Journal he plans to be more politically active than his father. According to FEC reports, Alex donated more than $725,000 to the Biden Victory Fund in 2020 and has given $11 million to left-wing PACs since 2010. Developing now, Kroger grocery stores across Kentucky and Ohio have been given the all clear after a string of bomb threats, according to authorities. Several stores in Cincinnati and northern Kentucky were evacuated on Saturday. Police said they found no evidence of any explosives in any of the locations. They believe the false alarms were part of a nationwide hoax that has been going on in recent months. Everybody was orderly, but again, everybody was pushing out and the police were pretty adamant about getting everybody out all the way down to that big low coffee. This kind of stuff right here, you never know. You never know. And it, I live, I mean, I work right across the street, so it was like, that's scary. The FBI has joined the investigation, but so far, no one has been arrested. Police say charges could fall under inciting panic or terrorist activity laws. Ahead here on the national desk, Ukraine's counteroffensive begins. Ukrainian Member of Parliament Kira Rudik joins us to discuss the tests the country faces in this next phase of war. And tracking some severe weather from over the weekend now, including a possible tornado knocking out power for tens of thousands of people in Tennessee. Plus, who is now at risk to see more storms today? The first breaking news right here at the live desk, we've just learned J.P. Morgan Chase agreeing to a tentative settlement in a class action lawsuit on behalf of victims who were sexually abused by Jeffrey Epstein over claims the bank ignored warnings about him. Now, this lawsuit was filed last November. The number of victims, some who were just teenagers at the time, could potentially rise to more than 100. We're back in 90 seconds. A live look over the city of Nashville for you this morning right here. A night of severe storms knocking out power for thousands across that state and a possible tornado causing some damage in the eastern portion of Tennessee. Right now, things are looking a lot better for people there. Power outages dropping down to about 10,000 within the past hour. A steep decline when you look at one point overnight. The state reported 30,000 people with that power. Looking ahead to the chance of storms today, hundreds of thousands who live in the area highlighted in orange on the map on your screen, including many across central Texas under enhanced risks for storms and millions that you see in yellow here will see slight risks today. Now for updates, stick with us both on air and online at the National Weather Desk, part of thenationaldesk.com. Ukraine's counteroffensive has begun. A phase in the war aimed at restoring Ukraine's territorial sovereignty and retaining Western support. Joining us this morning is Ukrainian Member of Parliament Kira Rudik. And Kira, uh, the Ukrainian military has begun its counteroffensive, as we mentioned, against occupying Russian forces, with forces mounting a major attack in the southern region of Zaporizhia. Do you think this counteroffensive will restore territorial sovereignty? Hello, Didi. Thank you so much for having me. Well, indeed, we all believe uh, in uh, the counteroffensive. We believe in our military commanders, who I think you would agree have been fantastic over the last 15 months, proving their capabilities and effectiveness, uh, uh, both with commanding the forces and also using the Western weapons provided by our allies.
But there is a huge difference between how this counteroffensive is perceived throughout the world and how we look at it inside Ukraine. You know, the whole world right now is expecting and having those high expectations saying when it's going to happen, how soon you will regain your sovereignty, when the war would be over. But for Ukrainian families, as of this point, almost every family has somebody fighting at the front. And if you imagine somebody that you love dearly, and this person who is at the trenches right now, uh, at the counteroffensive, will have to get out of the trenches and march forward. So, and of course, we are extremely worried about our loved ones. So for us, the counteroffensive is not only about regaining our sovereignty and territorial integrity, but also about making sure that we have minimal losses. It is critical for us because in democracy, and we are democracy, human's life is the high, has the highest value, and we are trying to operate the way that we preserve lives of our soldiers. Kira, also important to note here, this counteroffensive could also serve as a test of a U.S.-led strategy to prepare Ukrainian forces with increasingly advanced weapons and tactics. Is the Ukrainian military, do you think, they're ready to take this on? Well, we already have a proof of uh, using the Western weapons that were uh, not uh, used anyway before. And so the Patriot missile systems. Uh, so Russia has those missiles that they call called invincible, the Kinjal uh, supersonic missiles. And we were able to take them down uh, by using the Patriot missile systems. So it's not uh, the, the something we are discussing like theoretically. It is a practical way that our our forces were able to use uh, the um, uh, weapons provided by our allies with the most effectiveness and efficiency. And meanwhile, there's severe flooding and damage from the Nova Kohovica dam collapse. Uh, we've learned nine people have died thus far in the flooding. Hundreds uh, have been stranded, thousands without drinking water. Can you give us a sense of, of just what you're dealing with right now? So, well, imagine that uh, the 80 villages right now are flooded and too many we cannot even get and our emergency services are trying to get in and save people. Uh, at the moment, thousands of volunteers from around Ukraine uh, keep coming to the south and using their personal boats to help get out people and animals. It is both humanitarian and ecological catastrophe and uh, we even don't know when the water will go down. There are so many angles of how uh, this terrorist act would have an impact on people, not only right now, but in generations. Starting from the point that the toxic waste from the underneath the dam is right now going up. To the point uh, that mines that were in the ground at that territory are right now blown up with the water and will be, trans uh, will be transferred we don't know even where, up to the point that the whole flood territory will be unusable for their further agriculture for years. So if we are saying that we were the uh, breadbasket for the whole Europe and uh, the war in Ukraine had a huge impact on uh, the food uh, shortage crisis. So right now we are even less capacity of uh, providing the whole world, especially African countries, with the, um, with the food and the grains that we were uh, providing them before. So it is just terrifying if you can imagine people sitting on their roofs for three, four days with being unable to contact anybody and being unable to get help. And especially I'm worried about people at the occupied territories because Russians do not allow us to go there and help people and they continue shelling of the ones who are trying to get out. Kira, we have time for one quick question we want to ask you, and, and, and again, we appreciate your perspective there. According to a Washington Post article, the U.S. had intelligence of a detailed Ukrainian plan to attack Nord Stream pipeline. The CIA reportedly learned last June via a European spy agency that a six-person team of Ukrainian special operations forces intended to sabotage the Russia to Germany natural gas project. What do you make of this? Well, I have not heard about these news, but uh, I can tell you one thing. We are not terrorists. 
And uh, no matter that we were trying to show the world with all the ways that Russia is evil and that they uh, were getting ready for the full scale invasion, uh, I think their preparations uh, and uh, um, all the actions that may have happened and didn't happen is uh, uh, another sign of us alarming the world about uh, about the tragedy that has happened in, in our country 15 months ago. Kira Rudik, thank you so much for coming on the National Desk this morning. Thank you, and glory to Ukraine. Problems continue to plague West Coast ports. The Live Desk this morning tracking the latest bottleneck issues impacting American supply chains, plus the billions of cargo still stuck off the West Coast coming up in 90 seconds. Live look for you over Seattle this morning where cargo work remains at a standstill due to ongoing union disputes. Saturday operations grinding to a halt here as the dock workers union negotiate a new labor contract. And it's not just in Seattle, it's happening all along the West Coast. The shutdown threatening supply chains and retailers and could soon impact consumers just ahead of the back to school shopping season. Right now, experts estimate a whopping $5.2 billion worth of cargo is floating in ports along California's coast. West Coast ports account for roughly 12% of the nation's gross domestic product, with 40% of the country's imported goods arriving at L.A. area ports. The stoppage could end up costing the U.S. economy as much as a billion dollars a day. A live look here over Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. this morning. Right now, some major retail and manufacturing groups are urging lawmakers and the Biden administration to step in and help broker a deal. Crypto prices are showing signs of stabilizing this morning after last week's regulatory crackdown spurred a sharp weekend sell-off. The SEC filed lawsuits against Binance and Coinbase, accusing both of selling unregistered securities shortly after four of the 10 most valuable currencies fell in value by nearly 15%. The names of customers of collapsed cryptocurrency exchange FTX can remain secret. A bankruptcy judge in Delaware rejecting arguments from several media outlets to release customers' names, arguing the identities of FTX's customers are a trade secret. So to come in our next half hour, American arrested, another U.S. citizen detained in Moscow, what the Russian courts accuse him of doing. Plus, speaking out, the Marine veteran who restrained a New York City subway passenger breaking his silence to give his side of the story. But first, here's a look at America's news and weather now. I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti who look at the Northeast. Most areas in the Northeast today will get into some sun after some morning clouds and fog in many zones. Temps will top out in the 70s and low 80s. We are tracking some rain though. Notice some of that wet weather is moving into New York and southern New England tonight. That's about 8 p.m. That rain traverses up into northern New England by 8 a.m. on Tuesday. We'll get a solid break in the Northeast at some point during the day, Tuesday into Tuesday night. This next feature will bring some wet weather on Wednesday. I'm meteorologist Jonathan Myers, and here's a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. Perhaps a spot shower or two through the morning and midday hours up and down the 95 quarter, but it looks like it gets worse into the afternoon. Notice at 2.30, all the reds, the yellows, the oranges. Those could be some strong storms, maybe some gusty damaging winds and some downpours from Philadelphia down to Baltimore, uh, all the way east of Richmond to Norfolk, and then across the Delmarva and out into the evening hours with our latest cold front brings drier weather tomorrow. That's the scene here. Good Monday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael taking a look at your weather story across the Midwest. We got an area of low pressure spinning over the Great Lakes, giving some rain there for the day today, but pretty decent weather for most of the Midwest. That does spin up more showers as we head into your Tuesday for the Great Lakes in the Ohio Valley as we continue on into your Wednesday. Still great across the plains, 80s, 90s, and still some lingering showers, though, early Wednesday across portions of Ohio and Kentucky before we dry out some. Good Monday morning, I'm meteorologist Joe DiCarlo. Look at our forecast across the region. While it is going to be a warm day, if not very hot, as we head throughout mid-June, really cranking up the heat. Temperatures climbing into the mid to upper 90s. High humidity along the coast of Texas and Louisiana. Going to feel more like the triple digits. We are watching, though, for some strong and severe storms. North Texas around the DFW Metroplex this evening. We'll watch for all modes of severe weather. Mainly quiet overnight. More storms, though, around Arkansas. 
Good morning. I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. We've got well above normal temperatures for the Pacific Northwest with thunderstorms breaking out around the Rockies. Now there's concern around California, Sierra Nevada that we're going to have some flash flooding. Also concerns as some very strong thunderstorms are breaking out in the eastern portion of Colorado. And that's the scene from here. Desk, America's News Now. Now on the National Desk, America's News Now. Tracking the paper trail, lawmakers set to see more documents detailing foreign money and President Joe Biden. Making his case, the Marine charged with a death on a New York subway describes what he says led up to the critical confrontation. And reclaiming regions, Ukraine sharing new tales of triumph over Russia. And it comes as we learn of new rounds of attacks between the two countries. Ryan Smith is joining us at the Live Desk tracking these latest developments, Ryan. Yeah, and we have brand new video to show you here from the Live Desk showing Ukraine's army regaining control of regions in Zaporizhia and Kherson over the weekend as counteroffensive measures are underway. Meanwhile, we have more video here to show you what Russian officials now claim was an unsuccessful attempt by Ukraine to attack one of their naval ships. This happening near a major gas pipeline in the Black Sea with six high-speed drone boats. Now this marks the second such attack in several weeks time. Today Russia is celebrating its Independence Day and NATO is launching its largest Air Force military exercises ever set to run from today through June 23rd. Live look over Washington, D.C. this morning and the U.S. Capitol here today. President Biden will welcome NATO's outgoing Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg for Oval Office talks, the latest in a series of high-profile meetings with international leaders. Russian media says Moscow police have arrested an American man. His name is Michael Travis Leake, and he's accused of trafficking drugs to children. The charge carries a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. Authorities say they will keep Leek detained for two months until his trial. Leek is a musician who has been living in Russia for the past decade. The State Department says it's aware of his situation and is working to provide consular assistance. China has been spying on the U.S. from Cuba for years, according to a U.S. official. The National Desk, Kayla Gaskins, joining us live this morning from Capitol Hill with the latest information. Good morning, Kayla. Well, good morning, Didi. So this news comes after reports were circulating last week regarding a secret deal between Cuba and China to build an electronic eavesdropping facility on the island. They would there be able to collect intelligence from the United States. In exchange, China would pay Cuba billions of dollars. This is money the country could desperately use. Now, the Pentagon and White House both called those reports inaccurate. And we're now learning the facility reportedly already exists and has for years. Cuba is very close to the United States. It's about 90 miles from Key West, Florida, so very close there. Now, the former director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe, refutes the White House's claims. That says the spy facility was built back in 2019. That would have been when former President Donald Trump was in office. There wasn't one, Maria. That's where, you know, they uh, this, this idea... Uh, that this existed during the Trump administration is, is just what they did with the spy balloon. They tried to say, well, they denied it, and then they said, well, it happened, but it also happened during the Trump administration. Look, right. um, we took a, you know, a, a incredible inventory of, of, of China and its capabilities during the Trump administration, and the idea that this kind of uh, uh, surveillance platform was present and being allowed um, is just, you know, is just absurd. 
The Chinese also appear to be growing bolder in their aggression towards the United States. This facility would be the latest escalation of China's eavesdropping efforts. Earlier this year, a CCP spy balloon, like we just heard, crossing the continental U.S. before getting shot down by the American military. Suspected Chinese spies, also disguised as tourists, repeatedly tried to enter a U.S. military base in Alaska. And then during a vehicle search, soldiers, soldiers reportedly found a drone. Also, there was that very close encounter in the Taiwan Strait with a Chinese warship crossing just 150 yards in front of a U.S. destroyer. Live on Capitol Hill, I'm Kayla Gaskins for the National Desk, America's News Now. Kayla, thank you. This week, we could learn more about the bribery allegations against then Vice President Joe Biden. The House Oversight Committee will get access to two more FBI documents that members claim detail foreign money given in exchange for policy decisions. This comes after members saw a form last week that they describe as detailing how a Ukrainian businessman gave $5 million each to Joe Biden and Hunter Biden to end a corruption investigation into the Ukrainian energy company that Hunter Biden worked for at the time. The day, again, that House Oversight got access to the form that the FBI had that stated that Joe Biden received a $5 million bribery transaction when he was sitting vice president, they then indict President Trump again. So there is absolutely an exploitation and abuse of the justice system. We will be sending out more subpoenas, but the fact is, is that right now, I do believe that the only way that we can fully conduct a full investigation without interference from the DOJ and the FBI is if we impeach President Biden. And based on the evidence that we have, I think that that's something that's very likely. The White House has dismissed, has dismissed any concerns that President Biden did anything wrong. More attacks on police officers. New York City police released new numbers. Their officers suffered 32% more injuries by criminals so far this year than last year from January through March. More than 1,200 officers were hurt. That's compared to 949 in the first quarter of 2022. We are now hearing from the retired Marine charged in the death of a homeless man in New York City. Lawyers for Daniel Penny released a video statement from the 24-year-old yesterday. He denies trying to kill Jordan Neely on the subway last month, instead claiming he felt compelled to act based on Neely's actions towards others. The three main threats that he repeated over and over was I'm gonna kill you, I'm prepared to go to jail for life, and I'm willing to die. You know, this, is a, this was a scary situation, and uh, Mr. Neely came on, he was, he was threatening, he's, he's a, I'm 6'2", and he was taller than me. I was scared for myself, but I looked around, I saw women and children, he was yelling in their faces, saying, saying these threats, I couldn't just sit still. Some people say that I was holding on to Mr. Neely for 15 minutes, this is not true. I mean, between stops is only a couple minutes, so the whole interaction less, lasted less than five minutes. Neely never regained consciousness and was later pronounced dead. Daniel Penny is charged with manslaughter and he's due back in court next month. Ahead this morning, election impact. How the federal indictment against the leading GOP candidate could impact the presidential race. And costly decision, the danger of letting money sit around in payment apps. All new this morning here at the Live Desk, Swiss Bank UBS announcing it has officially taken over its rival Credit Suisse in the biggest banking merger in over a decade. UBS now agreeing to the $3.2 billion takeover amid concerns that severe, severe losses at Credit Suisse would destabilize the worldwide banking system. Regulators agreeing to cover $10 billion worth of Credit Suisse's losses, while UBS will incur the first $5.5 billion as part of that transaction. The Swiss government orchestrating the deal after the lender's stock plunged back in March, followed by a mass pullout of customers' money at the megabank. The U.S. Federal Reserve, U European Union's executive branch, and others worldwide signing off on this takeover. Credit Suisse was classified as one of the 30 globally significant banks because its collapse posed a wider risk of global financial system. The Trump indictment and Alex Soros, the son of George Soros, meets with another high-ranking official. This time, it's the vice president. Joining us this morning is Washington insider Armstrong Williams. And Armstrong, a lot of people already looking to Tuesday. Former President Donald Trump expected to surrender tomorrow after being indicted in a document probe. How do you think this will impact the GOP presidential field? You know, Didi, uh, I read the 
indictment in its entirety. And it was a little shocking how reckless the former president was in his total disregard for the rule of law and how he involved his secretaries, his valets, his lawyers in this process through text and through community, other communication to the point where they became so afraid that they became um, the his biggest um, indicters in working with the Department of Justice. How this will impact him, Didi, who knows? There's a CBS poll that was out right after the indictment showing that Trump is up by 38% against all contenders across this nation. Um, people like to compare this to Biden and Pence and Obama who also had classified information. But the difference is that uh, they did not obstruct, uh, try to um, delay the process or just flat out mislead the investigation. So whether it impacts um, the, the, the presidential race or not remains to be seen. But. Trump is not a victim in this process, and it was not a witch hunt. We will definitely be watching that uh, throughout this morning and tomorrow. Alexander Soros, another big story we're following, son of George Soros, recently met with the vice president. He has a history of meeting with high-ranking officials, Armstrong, and key figures in the Biden administration. What do you make of this access? Uh, I don't know if you saw the images of, over the weekend, Didi, where George Soros has officially turn over the uh, $25 billion uh, uh, enterprise to his son, Alexander. And Alexander was in the White House was by, with Vice President Kamala Harris. What is very interesting about this, DD, is that they wanted this photo um, shared across social media, and he was more than happy um, to put it out there. I, I think it's something this White House is not a shame of. George Soros spends a lot of money. You can see it, it was playing out with the state of district attorneys, with the prosecutors, the lawlessness that's going on in this country. He's funding many of these um, Democratic candidates. Uh, a lot of the, um, their underground that you cannot see to get out the vote. And so George Soros has become a major player. But the difference is his son is not as sophisticated, not as mature, and not as experienced as his father. We'll just see how long for, it will take for him to catch on. But seriously, they have serious money and will have a major impact in this upcoming presidential election. We want to know about a recent meeting. You had uh, Speaker Kevin McCarthy and former House Speaker Paul Ryan, along with business leaders from around the country at your Washington, D.C. home. Tell us more about that. It, it was actually uh, fascinating, Didi. Um, the speaker had just come off the debt ceiling, and we had this opportunity for him to talk to business leaders, talk about the economy, talk about the debt, the entitlement program, Social Security, Medicare, and when are we going to really have the real cuts um, so we don't face this like fiscal cliff um, every every um, two years? And the speaker was very open. But I think the one thing that speaker said that impressed many people who attended was the fact that it's important to work for both sides, that this country is divided. We need to build bipartisan support, but it's important to reach out to the business community that really create the jobs and opportunities, make the sacrifices. Um, to make sure that this economy continue to be the number one economy in the world. So it was an honor for me to have him in my Washington, D.C. home. And everyone walked away just shocked at his intellect and how, how what a great communicator and how sincere he was. And so it really gave me, D.D., an entire different uh, perspective of the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Well, thank you for sharing that insight. Before you go, Armstrong, the government of Ireland, this story has been making headlines, proposing to kill nearly 200,000 cows to achieve its climate goals. Do you think this would have an impact on climate change? <laughs> I tell you what, it will have an impact on farmers going out of business and people in, throughout Ireland not getting their food and the, to the to their table. Didi, it is so insane just to believe that this is what Ireland is proposing and, and and to sort of curtail what they consider to be climate change and, and how they've come to this conclusion. You have to ask yourself, who wakes up in the morning and come up with these ideas? It's almost a laughing stock if it were not so serious. All right, Armstrong Williams, always appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the National Desk. Thank you, Didi. Murder mystery, a new twist in the case of a Utah grief author accused of killing her own husband with a spiked drink. The witness testimony now in question. We break it down next right here at the Live Desk.
A Utah woman who wrote a children's book about coping with grief after her husband's death and was later accused of fatally poisoning him. She's scheduled to appear in court in Utah to determine whether she should remain detained or have an opportunity to post bail. Corey Richens, you see her here, charged with murder and drug possession. Prosecutors say in court documents that she slipped five times the lethal dose of fentanyl into her husband's cocktail amid marital disputes and fights over a multi-million dollar mansion. But her attorneys argue the evidence against her is circumstantial because police never seized fentanyl from the family home. After his death, the mother of three self-published an illustrated book about an angelic father watching over his sons. Now, the case became a true crime fixation when charges were filed last month. Now, if this case goes to trial, it could largely hinge on an unidentified informant who prosecutors say sold Richens the drugs medical examiners later found in her husband's system. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bring you the headlines from coast to coast. From EMT staffing shortages in Oregon to an emotional tribute to a fallen New York officer, we're taking the pulse of America. But we start with a warning in Ohio about money left in payment apps. Let's see this uh, Venmo app of yours. Wow, he's uh, rolling in it. $342 just sitting in his Venmo account. Is that bad? Yes. Chargeback 911, which helps recover lost revenue, says that might run into a problem if another crisis, like the recent failure of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and Republic Bank happens. And that's because the funds sitting in your app are most likely uninsured deposits because they aren't in a traditional bank account. Oh, zero. zero. She wins. <laughs> She's safe. Yeah, I ain't got no money on there, though. With that said, some funds may be eligible for pass-through insurance coverage. For example, if someone has a PayPal savings account, they would have deposit insurance through PayPal's partner bank. But a general PayPal account is not covered by insurance. You're using it to transfer money. It's not a savings account. It's not designed to be a savings account. Um, and so just remind yourself to transfer those funds out. Staff with AMR say the change they're proposing is temporary. By allowing a mix of EMTs and paramedics to respond, they could staff five more ambulances a day within the week. We're probably short eight to ten ambulances a day of where we want to be, but we just don't have enough paramedics to staff them. The Multnomah County Health is not considering this change right now. We think that uh, it would be better to use those on two EMT basic life support ambulances. Currently, a paramedic still has to respond to a call, and only they can deploy a basic life support ambulance from there. There's a small number of calls that are really critical patients where you really need those two paramedics on scene working together. Commissioner Sharon Myron says right now she's advocating for county leaders to make this change. As we go into the summer months, you know, we see even more people needing um, ambulance services. We And with the, the fentanyl overdose rates and the, we're just seeing crises of epic proportions. This was the scene early in the morning on July 22nd, 2022. Hours earlier, Anthony Mazurkowitz, a 29-year veteran of RPD, was killed in the line of duty. Tributes have poured in from all over. Retired RPD officer Brett Sobereski running 50 marathons over 50 consecutive days, the last three miles of which he was accompanied by hundreds of people all there to support Mass. And a greater than I had ever imagined. Um, with over a thousand people here. His route took him from Florida and finally back home to Rochester. Zerkowitz and Sobereski knew one another while they were in RPD together. We worked together. I knew him since he came on the job, but we never worked in the same unit. But I always consider him, you know, as a brother in blue and uh, just a tremendous, tremendous loss. The run took Sobereski on an odyssey of more than 1,300 miles. The incredible people that gave me their last dollars in their pockets to give to, to the donations. The people that hugged me and told me to hug his widow and to pass on the condolences. Uh, it was just, I met, the, I met the, the fabric of America. California parents who refuse to affirm their child's gender identity could be used against them in custody disputes.
The text of a new bill states in making a determination of the best interest of a child in a custody dispute. The court will consider the welfare of child, which includes a parent's affirmation of the child's gender identity. And another California bill would redefine the inability of any men and trans women to get pregnant is infertility. With this new definition, the bill would require insurance companies to cover their surrogacy costs, which California employers are expected to cover. Lawmakers supporting the bill say it's a step towards fertility equality for LGBTQ people. But critics say it would redefine infertility from a medical condition into a relationship status, such as being single. The White House receiving backlash this morning over its Pride Month display. It includes a rainbow pride flag flanked by two American flags. Some say the display violates the U.S. flag code, which they argue mandates the American flag be the center of any display featuring multiple flags. So far, no comment from the White House. One more successful Starlink launch for SpaceX in the books now and another plan for this afternoon. We take you to the overnight liftoff on this double launch day and what they are sending to space coming up in the next 90 seconds. It is a busy day in the space world. SpaceX with back-to-back -back launches planned for today, the first of which already taking off this morning. We'll give you a look at that right here. The Falcon 9 rocket launching from Cape Canaveral, Florida, just after 3 a.m. Eastern time, launching 52 Starlink satellites into space, joining the more than 4,000 that make up Starlink's grid, providing broadband internet to users worldwide. Now that launch marking the 39th of the year for SpaceX. Another launch set for this afternoon, 519 p.m. Eastern time for those setting your clocks from California's Vandenberg Air Force Base. Now this launch will deliver 72 micro satellites for commercial and government use. Before we close out the hour here, here's a look at America's news and weather where you live. I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti who look the northeast. Most areas in the northeast today will get into some sun after some morning clouds and fog in many zones. Temps will top out in the 70s and low 80s. We are tracking some rain though. Notice some of that wet weather is moving into New York and southern New England tonight. That's about 8 p.m. That rain traverses up into northern New England by 8 a.m. on Tuesday. We'll get a solid break in the northeast at some point during the day Tuesday into Tuesday night. This next feature will bring some wet weather on Wednesday. I'm meteorologist Jonathan Myers, and here's a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. Perhaps a spot shower or two through the morning and midday hours up and down the 95 quarter, but it looks like it gets worse into the afternoon. Notice at 2.30, all the reds, the yellows, the oranges. Those could be some strong storms, maybe some gusty damaging winds and some downpours from Philadelphia down to Baltimore, uh, all the way east of Richmond to Norfolk, and then across the Delmarva and out into the evening hours with our latest cold front brings drier weather tomorrow. That's the scene here. Good Monday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael taking a look at your weather story across the Midwest. We got an area of low pressure spinning over the Great Lakes, giving some rain there for the day today, but pretty decent weather for most of the Midwest. That does spin up more showers as we head into your Tuesday for the Great Lakes in the Ohio Valley. As we continue on into your Wednesday, still great across the plains, 80s, 90s, and still some lingering showers, though, early Wednesday across portions of Ohio and Kentucky before we dry out some. Good Monday morning, I'm meteorologist Joe DiCarlo. Look at our forecast across the region. While it is going to be a warm day, if not very hot, as we head throughout mid-June, really cranking up the heat. Temperatures climbing into the mid to upper 90s. High humidity along the coast of Texas and Louisiana. Going to feel more like the triple digits. We are watching, though, for some strong and severe storms. North Texas around the DFW Metroplex this evening. We'll watch for all modes of severe weather. Mainly quiet overnight. More storms, though, around Arkansas. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. We've got well above normal temperatures for the Pacific Northwest with thunderstorms breaking out around the Rockies. Now there's concern around California, Sierra Nevada that we're gonna have some flash flooding. Also concerns as some very strong thunderstorms are breaking out in the Eastern portion of Colorado. And that's the scene from here.